This is the CBC Morning Report for Thursday, July 6. I'm Tisha Hines. Good morning. In our top story, U.S. Secretary of State Anthony Blinken and the President of Rwanda, Paul Kagame, addressed regional leaders yesterday as CARICOM marks its 50th anniversary. More in this report. The United States on Wednesday demonstrated its commitment to CARICOM by sending its most senior diplomat to meet with regional leaders as the bloc celebrated its 50th anniversary. Anthony Blinken noted that the founding fathers of CARICOM made the deliberate decision to call it a community. And it's a word that recognizes that to fulfill people's hopes, meet their needs, countries across the region have to work together and every member has to do their part. I think that's never been more true than it is today, uh, not only for CARICOM members, but also for the United States. We know that our fates are intertwined. We know that to deliver for our people, as Prime Minister Manley said so many years ago, we have to find even more strength in our union. And the reason that, that I'm here, the reason that my colleagues are here, today on this very powerful occasion is to tell you, to share with you, that you can count on America being by your side. CARICOM Chairman Dominica's Prime Minister Roosevelt Skerritt outlined what CARICOM sees as some of the major issues affecting the region. We welcome the opportunity of your visit, which serves to strengthen our mutual desire to continue working closely to find solutions for the issues of great significance to the Caribbean, which will come before Congress. I speak more specifically to, one, the political and humanitarian crisis in Haiti. Two, the challenges posed by the loss of correspondent banking, which continues to be a priority for the region. Three, the dire issues of climate change, which for many of our member states has become one of survival. One of survival. And four, the growing small arms trade, which is infiltrating our small societies. We look forward to your support for the requisite legislation necessary to address the threats posed to our financial systems and ability to trade by the loss of correspondent banking. We continue to count on your support in the Congress to reinforce our efforts to address this and other challenges which stand to affect the region's sustained development and prosperity. Earlier on Wednesday, regional leaders met with President of Rwanda, Paul Kigami, who said the meeting provided an opportunity for him to urge CARICOM to seek a closer relationship with Africa. The African diaspora which is known as the sixth region of the African Union, has particularly called for deeper cooperation with the Caribbean, and this all has been reciprocated. But I want to suggest that it is past time to go beyond the declarations of intent. We need to come together in your terms and focus on concrete initiatives which address the challenges that nations like ours face today. It is possible to do so. The African head of state was also critical of the lack of financing for developing countries to deal with the impact of climate change. It will be a major talking point at the third United Nations Conference on Landlocked Developing Countries to be held in Rwanda next June. In fact, in terms of climate vulnerability and financing needs, there are similarities between landlocked countries and small island states. You could think of it as a coalition of the landlocked and the sea locked, if you will, working together to make sure our voices are heard. But money isn't everything, 
and we should concentrate on what we can do on our own without waiting for anyone else's approval or funding. Coming up on the CBC Morning Report, mass shootings in the U.S. claim 19 lives already for July. United States President Joe Biden has urged lawmakers to act. United States President Joe Biden has urged lawmakers to act after a series of shootings in major cities killed at least 10 people, underscoring the country's ongoing struggle with gun violence. 19 people have been killed by gun violence in the first five days of this month alone. The grim statistics indicate the 4th of July weekend is the riskiest time for mass shootings. The latest occurring late Sunday night in Philadelphia where a 40-year-old local resident opened fire randomly. He was armed with a high-powered assault rifle and handgun, wearing a bulletproof vest and in possession of a police scanner. He surrendered to police who say they are still investigating the motive for the shootings. On what was supposed to be a beautiful summer evening, this armed and armored individual wreaked havoc, firing with a rifle at their victims, seemingly at random shooting seven, killing five, including children, babies. President Biden and his wife had invited members of the National Education Association to celebrate the holiday at the White House. The occasion marred by the news of yet another shooting and yet another call for greater gun regulation. But Congress needs to step up, pass common sense gun safety laws to protect our kids and educators. And by the way, Arming teachers is not the answer. Arming teachers is not the answer. Banning assault weapons and high-capacity magazines, extensive background checks, they're part of the answer. In Baltimore this past weekend, two people were killed and more than 20 injured in a shooting at a block party. In several gun incidents in Chicago, a total of five people were killed and 33 wounded. This on the first anniversary of a shooting in nearby Highland Park in which seven people were killed last year. And more gun victims in Fort Worth, Texas. Right now we know that two uh, persons have succumbed to their injuries and have passed away from being shot at this point. Republicans in Congress continue to resist calls to pass meaningful gun legislation, including a ban on assault weapons. This in the face of statistics showing more than 340 mass shootings have taken place in the U.S. this year alone. The International Atomic Energy Agency has requested additional access to parts of the nuclear power plant in southern Ukraine after reports of possible military action around the site intensified. Fears of a nuclear disaster at the Zaporizhia plant have regularly surfaced as fighting flared in and around it since the start of the war. Kyiv says Russian forces could now be planning a so-called false flag operation, setting off explosives on the roof of the plant to make it look like Ukrainian forces are attacking it. We have information from our intelligence that on the roof of several power units of the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant, the Russian military installed objects similar to explosives, perhaps to simulate the hit on the plant. Maybe they have some other scenarios. 
For its part, Moscow has accused the Ukrainians of planning to attack the plant with long-range precision weapons. The situation at the plant is quite tense because the threat of sabotage by the Kyiv regime is high and the consequences will be catastrophic. The Kyiv regime has repeatedly demonstrated its willingness to stoop to anything. Both sides have drawn comparisons with the recent destruction of the Kharkovka Dam, which caused extensive flooding and which they blame each other for. Moscow says the destruction of the dam shows what Kyiv is capable of. Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky says the failure of the international community to punish Russia for destroying the dam has emboldened it now to attack the nuclear plant. Ukraine's Ministry of Health has warned people living near the plant to prepare to evacuate the area in case of a major radiation leak. I have a small bag with clothes in case I have to throw away the ones I'm wearing and some medication and documents with me, as well as water and a face mask. That's it. I follow the news and of course I hope that everything will turn out fine. Nuclear energy is not a joke at all. We've already had this once before and it's something that's frightful in principle. Since the start of this war, people in the Zaporizhia region have lived with the added fear of a nuclear catastrophe. But the precise nature of these latest warnings seem to raise the threat of a potential incident. It's time now to preview what's coming up on Morning Barbados. The St. Peter Parish Independence Committee, they'll be having a treasure hunt and we'll tell you all about that. Plus, pan and pork artistry. That's coming up at the Lloyd Erskine Sandiford Center. What is? it we will tell you about that we're going to update you as we salute our positive youth we are going to be telling you more about the mr executive interschool business and gentlemen's challenge once again today as we share a little bit more about the projects the young men are going to be doing and some additional exceptional youth will be here from the saint gabriel's primary school um, they have a STEM ovation projects uh, that they're working on, and we'll share more about that. Plus, our new segment, The Eyes Have It. That's all coming up on Morning Barbados. But next, news, sports, and weather here on The Morning Report. Stay with us. An unspecified incident at the Grantley Adams International Airport last evening resulted in an aircraft being grounded and searched by police. Confirmation of this from airport officials and the Barbados Police Service. Police Commissioner Richard Boyce provided some details. The Barbados Police Service received a report of an incident at the Grantley Adams International Airport where there was a security breach. We responded to that report Persons from my department, trained persons, responded to the situation. Now we conducted searches at the airport, also including where the plane, a plane was searched. And because of that, we are currently continuing to investigate the matter. We are looking at the situation, and our main task now is to make sure we look after the safety and security of all persons who were, in, or who were involved in that incident. The airport CEO Hadley Bourne said the affected passengers are being taken care of by the airline. He thanked the police, 
Barbados Fire Service and others involved in the response to the incident. A number of cropover bands have been making use of the duty-free concessions to cut the cost of importing costume supplies. That's according to Senior Business Development Officer with the National Cultural Foundation, Andre Hoyt. He was speaking during a media event to announce Pace Digital as the digital payment partner for the 2023 Cropover Festival. We've had quite a number of, of the bands access that concession um, where they get the duty wave on the import of those raw materials. So that has been going pretty smoothly. Uh, most people um, have, will have started early in the year as well with their application for their duty-free license and um, obviously with their um, items coming in as early as in February. So um, I can say that more than we have more than 10 bands who have actually accessed that to date and we haven't had any complaints with that process as yet. Band leader of Colors Entertainment, Brian Worrell, has confirmed his band is utilizing the concession. He, however, notes shipping continues to be a challenge with importing some supplies. A lot of people are still shipping in things at this time, even myself waiting on things to come in. Um, so it's still a bit of a struggle. We, we do have the ability through the initiative again by the foundation and my guy Andre here was spearheading that initiative for the cultural ambassadors to be able to get the duty free waivers. Um, I myself am an ambassador and take advantage of, of those facilities. And it works so in, in that regard to save us some money in terms of the imports. Um, like I said, we constantly will be going back asking for things to be a little smoother because we still experience some challenges with customs and things from time to time and try to get the process to be a little bit faster. But um, I would still say that we are, we are still managing. As we mentioned, Pace Digital has partnered with them. Chief Executive Officer Alison Brown Ellis explains that under the agreement with the NCF for this year's festival, Pace Digital cardholders will have a secure way to pay for costumes and tickets for all major events. This affords patrons the opportunity to enjoy ease of doing business when accessing trusted platforms such as the Pace Digital mobile app. Our goal for this season is to empower our customers. From the comfort of your home or while on the go, the Pace Digital and NCF partnership will allow customers the option to pay for their event tickets using the Pace Digital mobile app and having their, their tickets emailed directly to them for, to allow for digital download. The Belize Coast Guard has enhanced its disaster preparedness this 2023 Atlantic hurricane season. Commandant Rear Admiral Elton Bennett says its seamen are currently conducting training seasons geared at improving their disaster relief plan. We look at where the organization is and the, the first thing that we need to do is to ensure that the Coast Guard can survive a hurricane so that when the hurricane passes we can deliver services to the country. So our, our first um, activity is to safeguard the Coast Guard um, and that means uh, force protection in terms of identifying locations where we can safeguard our vessels. So that's the first step that we do and then um, we're responsible for early warning. So these are routine um, requirements that the National Emergency Management Organization would require us to, to do. Um, so it means updating the uh, maritime community in terms of who is where. Um, from these small fishing camps at these remote and isolated locations, that, were, that is what we're currently doing on exercise, getting out and to see who is where so we can have a network um, and know exactly and how we can communicate and conduct evacuation of those remote locations. Um, so it's a, it's a continuous cycle. Um, something that, that keeps us occupied and busy and, and ensure that, that we are able to, to provide that service when that time comes. Um, then of course search and rescue is, is one of the big functions that we do in, in a hurricane. In Guyana, voter turnout for recent local government elections continued to decline. There were many areas where no voting was done. The figure was provided via a media release issued by the Guyana Elections Commission, as we hear from Newsroom Guyana. This year, the local government elections were held on June 12. 
Just under a month since people went to the polls to vote, the Ghana Elections Commission has released official figures on voter turnout. According to GCOM, 34.97% of the people eligible to vote actually voted. A total of 540,056 persons were eligible to vote in the areas that were contested, but only 188,856 persons actually voted. That amounts to just over one-thirds of the voting population, pointing to a low voter turnout. And this year's voter turnout was lower than the 36.3% recorded in the 2018 polls and the 47.1% in 2016. Notably though, there was no voting in 13 of the 80 local authority areas since only one party, the People's Progressive Party Civic, had candidates there. In other words, there were no contests in these areas and the PVP candidates will now manage those places. Additionally, there were two areas where there were no contests at the proportional representation, commonly called the popular vote, portion of the elections. Those areas were Diamond Place, Golden Grove and Canefield Enterprise local authority areas. The voter turnout in the 10 municipalities, according to GCOM, are as follows. Mabaruma, 51.5%, Anna Regina, 37.21%, Georgetown, 28.1%, New Amsterdam 37.65%, Rose Hall 34.19%, Carriverton 28.35%, Bartica 40.96%, Madia 42.57%, Letem there was no contest and Linen 37.05%. Jamaica's Transport Minister Darrell Vaz is coming in for scrutiny in his post following a video in which it appears he ran a red light. The video, which has since made its way onto several social media platforms, is however being dismissed as deceptive, with the minister refuting the claim, adding the traffic light was malfunctioning. CVM Television has that report. No stranger to controversy, Transport Minister Darrell Vaz is again having to defend his decision to drive through a red light in a section of Portmore St. Catherine in June. In a short video allegedly captured by another motorist, the minister is seen entering his still vehicle under a traffic signal while the motorist recording complained of the obvious breach. The minister entered his vehicle on the driver's side and drove off after the light briefly changed from amber to red. The political firebrand and Portland West Member of Parliament explained his actions, which he admitted to CVM Live. I can confirm that further to my tweet earlier today in response to the incident that it happened on the 9th of June, and I'm able to verify that as I have gone through the call log on my cellular phone as to when I made the call to the Traffic Management Division of the NWA to report it. I was the driver of the vehicle. Uh, and a sole passenger in the vehicle and I had come out of the vehicle to check on some fragile items that were in the back of the vehicle that I heard making noise to make sure that they were not, uh, they were not br uh, broken. The minister says the traffic signal malfunctioned and he's been made to know that that light is prone to fault. So as a public figure I'm always upfront and open and honest no matter what the situation is and this is the situation as of now. And I understand it's not the first time and it's a regular occurrence that that particular intersection, the lights at that intersection at Passage Fort and Dyke Road have a history of giving uh, problems and malfunctioning. However, social media attempted to drag the policymaker demanding penalties for his actions, some insisting this is simply how those in authority abuse the very laws they fight to enforce. Others a bit more lenient and sympathetic to the minister at the height of campaign season for local government elections. Efforts to verify with the National Works Agency whether steps have therefore been taken to replace or repair the traffic lights on Monday proved futile. Minister Vaz recently acquired the portfolio, which he insists will be marked by firm and decisive leadership, especially concerning reckless driving. 
The United Nations nuclear watchdog is set to give its backing to Japan's plan to release millions of tons of treated retroactive, radioactive rather, water from the tsunami-wrecked Fukushima Daiichi power plant into the Pacific Ocean. The International Atomic Energy Agency chief, Rafael Grossi, began a four-day visit to Japan earlier this week. In the 12 years since the Fukushima disaster, the devastated nuclear power plant has transformed into something that more resembles a water storage site. 1.3 million tons of radioactive water that had been used to cool the melted reactor cores or rain and groundwater that had flowed into the buildings has been accumulating in more than a thousand containers. Japan's government says they're at near capacity. After a two-year review, the International Atomic Energy Agency has endorsed Japan's plan for a discharge into the Pacific Ocean lasting 30 to 40 years. As a responsible leader of the international community, I have repeatedly stated that I will not allow a discharge that would have a harmful impact on human health and the environment of both Japan and the world. In sports, Barbados won another gold medal at the ongoing CAC Games in El Salvador last night when Shane Brathwick placed first in the men's 100-meter hurdles. Brathwick clocked 13.64 seconds, the same time as Rasheem Brown of Cayman Islands, but Brathwick was given the gold via the photo finish. Also yesterday, Matthew Wright won a bronze medal in men's triathlon. Ranked 106th in the world, Wright completed the swim, bike and run in a time of 1 hour 46 minutes and 36 seconds. The winner of the event was Aram Penaflor of Mexico in 1 hour 44 minutes 51 seconds with another Mexican athlete, Cristiano Gonzalez, finishing in second in a time of 1 hour 45 minutes 51 seconds. It has been an outstanding year for 31-year-old Wright who has had a string of top 10 finishes in four world-class competitions this year. Meanwhile, Barbados won another medal when the women's hockey team defeated Dominican Republic 4-2 on penalty flicks after the bronze medal playoff ended 2-all in regulation time. The Bajan ladies were trailing 2-0 until they made use of two penalty corners in the 60th minute to level the score at 2-all via Jamila Edwards and Ayana Wilson. Then there were two crucial saves from goalkeeper Ayana Aline Germain in the penalty shootout that gave Barbados the 4-2 win. Team Barbados now has seven medals following the gold by Chelsea Tuak in surfing, silver by Michelle Elliott in shooting, and bronze medals by Jabali Breedy in boxing and Amber Joseph in cycling. In other results last night in the women's 800-meter final, Sonia Gaskin finished just outside the medals, pacing fourth in two minutes, 5.50 seconds, and Matthew Clark was also fourth in the men's 200-meter final in 20.49 seconds. Let's take a look now at the weather. The barometric pressure stands at 1014.2 millibars. It's 26.8 degrees Celsius. The relative humidity stands at 79% and the winds are blowing out of the east at 21 kilometers per hour. The present temperature is fair with slight haze. Sea conditions for today in Barbados. Smooth to moderate in open water with swells peaking at 2 meters and increasing. And here's a look at how the tides roll in. General conditions for Barbados today. Here's what you can expect. Partly sunny with a few brief isolated light showers. As we move into the evening period, you can expect much of the same. A mix of clear skies and clouds with a few brief scattered light to moderate showers. Here's a look at a few select international cities. That's weather and that's the morning report. Remember, our next newscast is Newsday at 12 noon on TV8, followed by The World at One via our network of stations, 100.7 FM, 98.1 and 94.7 FM. It's time now for Morning Barbados. Wake up, wake up, wake up, wake up. Barbados, get up. Good morning.
It's Thursday, July 6th. Welcome to another presentation of Morning Barbados. Glad to have you with us today. I'm Tisha Hines. I'll be here with you until 8 o'clock this morning. Remember, you can join us online on YouTube or Instagram. We're also streaming on Facebook. So call your friends and relatives across the diaspora and let them know they can get a taste of Barbados. Find out what's happening right here at home. So let me update you on what's coming up on today's show as you get ready to head off to work and school or if you're retired on vacation, that's okay. As you relax, I hope that you'll spend that little time with us. So today we're going to have the Not My Eyes Inc. Annalee Brown-Smith, CEO, founder and organizers of Not My Eyes, will be in to share more about how she is working to help uh, the blind and deaf. So very interesting concept she has, and we're going to be sharing more about that. Plus, pan and pork artistry, Dale Harrison and Chef Maloney are going to be in to tell us more about smart catering and something called the Pan and Pork Artistry event that's coming up at the Lloyd Erskine Sandiford Center, July 14th to 15th. We're going to let you know exactly how you can be a part of that. Now, we had a really great time and a big response from you about the young men who appeared on the show yesterday for the Mr. Executive Interschool Business and Gentlemen's Challenge. And we're going to have so much more about them today. Today, they're talking to us all about their projects that they're doing in their various neighborhoods. And you definitely want to stick around for that. I'm hoping that a whole lot more people from corporate Barbados and just regular Barbadians alike and students come out and show them their, your support on September 3rd when they have the actual show. Plus, we are back today with The Eyes Have It. It's a little competition that we're doing with you, giving you a chance to have a little fun. Identify some of the most uh, popular figures for crop over just by their eyes. So we're going to see how well you can do for that. As we continue to salute our exceptional youth, you can look out for some students from St. Gabriel's Primary School. They're a part of a STEM project that we're going to tell you more about. So that's all coming up today on Morning Barbados. You definitely don't want to miss it. But starting, we are going to tell you all about the St. Peter Parish Independence Committee treasure hunt. Always fun, treasure hunts. I don't know the last time I did a treasure hunt, but um, maybe this will be the one to get my attention. Gail Ann Holder, the Par St. Peter Parish Independence Committee member, and Greg Agard Balgrave, the chair of that committee, are going to join us now to tell us more about that. Good morning, St. Peter, and welcome. Good morning. Thank you. Good morning. All right. First of all, uh, Greg, you have to tell me where in St. Peter you are and what makes that part of St. Peter the best place to be in the parish? Well, actually, I'm in Church Street, Spikestown, St. Peter at present. Um, and what makes it so unique is the history Spikestown has to offer. So that makes it very unique. All right. Well, Galen. Galen, I don't know if you see what I'm doing here. I'm pitting you guys against each other. You know, that's where we're starting. So where in St. Yeah. Peter are you? <laughs> I am five minutes walk from Greg. So <laughs> it's basically the same thing. All right. So you, you guys win. So I know that you're always active. I saw you uh, last weekend at the Digicel opening gala with the... Uh, parish ambassadors, they came out to support, of course, the opening gala came to St. Peter at Heyman's factory, uh, recently renovated, still lots of work to go, but it was beautiful. It was a, a really great place to be. Uh, I truly enjoyed it. And I know you guys were happy to be able to come there as well, but you have something big planned, Greg. So tell me all about it. Yes, um, we're having a treasure hunt on July the 8th. On we are looking to start at the Spikestone Esplanade, or as you know, Orange Fort, if you're looking at history, the Orange Fort, where the cannons were. And we are looking to start at nine o'clock. Um, the whole aim of this treasure hunt is to get people aware or to come out and just explore St. Peter and see the hidden gems which we have to offer. 
and in so doing have fun and get to learn more history about St. Peter. That certainly is beautiful. Galen, tell me about these hidden gems. I'm just kidding. That'll all be a part <laughs> of the treasure hunt. So tell me how things will unfold, how people can register to be a part of this treasure hunt. Okay, um, at this time we're doing registration um, the morning as they come. Um, it's $10 um, per team of four in a car or $15 for a team of three or less. Why we have it that way is that Although that is a fundraiser and we do want the funds, we also want persons to come out. So, you know, um, we may just like things cheap. So if you have 10 people, in, <laughs> if you have four people in a car and that's $10, if I got three people, I would say like, um, I got extra per, I got put an extra person, I would pay 10 instead of 15. So <laughs> that's the concept behind having the 10 and the 15 each um, thing. Um, so we done registration on the morning when they come, they will get the first clue and move off. And as they find their clues and their markers, we will let them know that yes, they have the correct place and then we will send the other clue on to them. We have a limited time in which to find is about 16 um, places of interest in Barbados. There are some that are well known and some that are not, I don't think as well known to persons. So we're trying to get people aware of the places of interest in Barbados. And we have a few um, fun activities in between finding those places as well. Oh, sounds truly <laughs> exciting. Now this is a fundraising effort. So tell me uh, what the funds are being raised for Greg. What are you guys planning ahead? Um, this all goes towards our first project. This year we are health and wellness, where we are looking mental health and um, share with people the stigma that is um, associated with it. Try to, you know, get that stigma put on one side. And it's all part of our project with our parish ambassadors this year. All right, um, you know, that that's a major bugbear right now for me and hearing all of what's been going on across the island, we most certainly need more mm -hmm. attention paid in that area. So I commend you guys for doing a project that at least has a component that you hone in on mental health and look at what we need to do to be able to help people along who are, um, you know, working through living with mental illness or having uh, mental health challenges. So that's very, very important. That really is all of us. All right, so Gaylan, are there any events that are coming up in the near future? Yes, um, we're actually in the planning now of our heritage um, bus ride, which will be on August 13th. Um, there's also the talent, is a zona talent show that is, 19th, I think, right? August? I think it's the 19th of August. And also in September, yeah. we're planning our fish fry as 26th. well. On the 26th, 26th of August at the Daryl Jordan School. It's, it's a talent show, it's a zonal talent show. So just what we are south, it will be the others in the north as well. All right, so that's a, a big calendar. Where, where can where can we find that? If you you wanted to clarify, Greg. Greg, you wanted to clarify on some of the dates. Um, yeah, the show is on August the twenty sixth at Daryl Jordan School. Um, that would involve Saint Lucy, Saint Andrew, Saint James, Saint Peter. Um. We're also looking at a health fair on the 19th of August at the St. Peter's Parish Church. Um, also stemming from this treasure hunt, we're looking for people to, you know, unwind and come out, just have fun, relax, take off that stress, <laughs> seeing that we're dealing with the mental health. You know, get some fresh air out there and just enjoy yourselves when you come out. So come out and support us to the rest of the events that we have coming up and do enjoy. 
All right, definitely sounds that like you guys are quite busy. I understand that there was a search for talent on as well. I suppose that was for the zonal talent show, Gaynal, Gaylan. Um, uh, is it now closed off or do you have all the talented people from St. Peter that you need? Um, I don't think um, it's we can quite still have a few more. Yet. The deadline for yeah, uh, is the fourteenth. The deadline is know, July fourteenth. July to yeah. sign up, give us a call, go on our Instagram page or Facebook page, and you will see the registration forms for the talent show on our pages. All right, St. Peter Got Talent Search, singing poetry, instrumentals, dance, drama, whatever you do, bring your talent and come and represent for St. Peter as they go into the talent competition, the zonal talent competition that's coming up a little later. I believe you said, Greg, in August? Yes. Yes, please, August 26th. All right, final word for each of you. How have things been going with your ambassadors? I know it's uh, a year of ambassadorial duties, and you guys are always very visible. Uh, you make sure that you're involved with many, many different things, and you really keep the committee working for the people of St. Peter. So final word from you, Mr. President. Well, we have very two active ambassadors this year and they are eager to do anything out there to get into the community to share that awareness of the importance of the community independent spirit and they are working very hard so i would just like to encourage the residents in st peter come out and support your ambassadors alia jordan and ethan waterman all right, and thank you so much, Greg Agard Belgrave. All right, your signal from St. Peter is getting here a little later <laughs> than usual, man. <laughs> All right, that's okay. So, Mr. Greg Agard Belgrave, chair of the St. Peter Parish Independence Committee, and Gail Ann Holder, a member of the committee, thank you for coming on and sharing with us. I wish you the best on the treasure hunt. I'm going to pull my $10 together and three more people, and we definitely are coming to register because I think I know all the perfect spots in St. Peter. So I, I don't think there, there's <laughs> anything know, you, you know. could put this treasure hunt that you could trick me. You might be surprised. <laughs> yeah, I love surprises, yeah. so we'll see. All right, have a great day. Yeah, thanks okay? for having us, and everybody Thank enjoyed it. Thank you. Okay, bye-bye. Coming up next, we are telling you all about Annalie Boyne-Smith, CEO, founder, and organizer of Not My Eyes, Inc. That's next. Stay with us. Morning, morning, morning. Good morning. Good morning to you. All right, so good morning once again. Welcome back to Morning Barbados on this Thursday. The time is going by so quickly. If there's something that you really, really feel like you should do, you absolutely should get on it. I know that sometimes we feel like, oh, that's so big a task. Where do I start? 
this next story will give you that inspiration you need to make a move. Let's welcome Annalie Bowen Smith, who's CEO, as I told you, CEO and founder and organizer of Not My Eyes Inc. Good morning and welcome. Good morning. Thank you for having me. All right. So uh, we're always reaching out to Barbadians near and far, and she's here this time, but you reside in the U.S. Yes. So uh, you moved away from Barbados in 1989. Yes. Talk to me about that move. Well, um, I moved because my dad um, and my mom, we, they migrated to the United States to make a better living for us. Um, he was a part of the, the Barbados Defense Force, but, you know, as they say, you move to the, the States to get a better life. So, um, during the time we moved, I went through school, I graduated um, high school and went into college. Um, actually, um, graduated as an occupational therapy from the Long Island University in Brooklyn. And um, my eyes started to deteriorate around that time. So. Um, after I had my daughter, so um, you know, I started to work for Helen Keller um, Services for the Blind, where I met my husband, and um, what have you. But really and truly, my passion was more into fashion, and um, I, I did a couple of modeling shows and what have you. But success didn't really come to the year of um, 2020. So that's where everything went well for me. Um, even though it during the times of COVID, but it was a positive move for me. I um, entered a competition called um, The Face of Curvaceous. And um, Cur Face of Curvaceous, I, that year actually I, um, I became runner up. And then the following year, I worked with a modeling coach, uh, Miss Jeannie Ferguson. Shout out to my model coach, Miss Jeannie Ferguson. She worked with me and um, I was able to win that same competition that I was runner up for for the previous year. And then from there, I became um, a cover girl for Smooches Women magazine, um, the summer edition. I was featured in many different magazines such as Queen Size Magazine, La Motto, Women Empowerment uh, Magazine, and the latest one is called La Motto that I've been featured in. All right, so, so let's take a little step back <laughs> because you said your vision started to deteriorate at a certain point in time. Talk to me about what was happening with you at that point in time and, and what caused your vision to deteriorate at that time. Sure. Um, so I um, have a condition, my brother and I, because I have two older brothers. My second older brother and myself, um, we have a, a condition called retinitis pigmentosis. So our Ton we only see through our true tunnel. Sorry, excuse me. We start to deteriorate um, peripherally. So, um, you know, I realized that my eye visions was getting very bad. Like, you know, certain things I used to see, I can't see anymore. And so I was able to just try to adapt to it. Not everybody can't adapt to it, but I was more, I'm a person that's very determined, very confident, and I don't let things bother me. So, I, um, you know, turned that around, um, me not seeing into me just adjusting to it. How were you able to adjust? Talk to me about that. Um, <laughs> uh, to, to still go through, uh, you, know, you know, what you were doing. Obviously, you said you had uh, a qualification in occupational therapy. Yes. Did it mean that you had to pivot and look at something new yes. that you had to do career wise? Yes. Uh, how did it change your day to day? It changed a lot. Um, it changed in a negative way and a positive way because I was already set up. My mind was set to doing occupational therapy. So as you stated, you know, I had to pivot that because um, occupational therapy is a lot of hands-on and a lot of, um, as far as, you know, you, you visual, put it like that. So um, I end up working at the Helen Keller Services for the Blind as a production assistant. I was doing, um, you know, with the Braille um, and large print books. I was, you know, just reassessing them and what have you. So uh, the way I adjust is just that, you know, I more took my time of doing things and rushing. Um, instead of um, dealing with uh, regular print, I dealt with large print and just 
feeling my way around instead of um, me trying to do things on my own. So it was a more of a slower process for me than for me doing a regular um, pace of walking or any activities that I do. Usually when people have such a major event in their lives, mm -hmm. uh, like you had through loss of vision, they, 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 you consider that they might take a back seat. But here you were, uh, you had to, you know, change your view mm -hmm. in terms of uh, where you wanted to go in your career. Yes. And you kept pace with that. And then you had a dream about being a model yes. through your love for fashion <laughs> and you pursue that as well. Correct. How do you feel that you were able to, I know you said that you're a determined person, mm -hmm. but then, um, you know, with this happening, you must have thought to yourself, this is going to be equally as challenging or even more challenging for me now. So how were you able to work through that? Well, like you said, it is, it was um, challenging because um, even with the modeling, like I, you mentioned, um, when I first dealt with my coach, she, I said to her, um, you know, what, do you think I can do it? She said, of course you can do it, but you just have to work twice as hard. So for me to be that person to just push, and I, I, as I, I can't express anymore, I, I'm very determined, I persevere a lot, even though it might be, uh, uh, take a longer time, I still gonna, I is the type of person like, listen, if I gonna get this done, I gonna get it done and I'm not gonna stop <laughs> until I get mm. it done. So <laughs> that's me. <laughs> now, I know that you, you're here in Barbados. Yes. And you've not only let your success stop mm -hmm. at, you know, at Annalie's feet. <laughs> so you, uh, you've experienced a level of success in your modeling. Yes. And with your fashion, uh, your love for fashion and so on, yes. and you're kind of bringing other people along. Yes. Uh, I know that you're giving mm -hmm. here in Barbados. Yes. Tell me about that initiative. Well, yes. Um, so um, let me just um, retract a back, back a little bit back. Um, when I had won that competition in 21, I had to um, put my play, uh, set my place a, a platform where I wanted to give back. So my platform was to give back to the visually impaired and blind community because I feel as, you know, we don't be in recognized a lot. So we like the bottom of the barrel. So this is where Not My Eyes um, Foundation was created and um, the fashion show was created under the foundation. So the first year we started, um, we give back to a uh, organization called Foundation Fighting Blindness, and that was based in, out of New York. And so now it was um, the second year, which is this year, April passed. I said, you know what? Instead of giving to those fortunate in the States, they have it. But we in the islands, they don't have it, you know, and they lack us many sources and resources. So, and it's also to bring awareness that just because we might have our disability or whatever the case may be, you know, don't, don't look at us, don't shine your face away from us. So, um, this is the first time um, I started off because Barbados is my birthplace. I started off with Barbados and it was a pleasure and an honor to give to the Barbados Association for the Blind and Deaf. And based on yesterday's experience, I see where they are in dire need of that contribution. That's right. I know that you gave the contribution yesterday. Talk us about talk to us about that ceremony and how it went. What are the areas that they desire the help and uh, your your support, your wonderful support, will be helping. <clears throat> yes. Um, so based on yesterday's experience, I saw where because my husband he was here with me along with my family and. Um, they were speaking to us in regards to the the software that these folks need um, as far as to use as far as the computers as technology and they're 13 years no sorry excuse me 10 years behind as far as the technology um, along with the computer usage and what have you 
So I do believe that that contribution would help them, even so when they were describing to us and showing us as well the caning of the, the chairs and, you know, the different things in different areas that they need. So I do believe that was a great choice of um, contributing that to them. Well, thank you. It truly is wonderful that you decided to come and give back to your home, Barbados. Yes. <laughs> and uh, I want to step back to that April show that you put on sure. where you had 22 participants. Yes. Talk to us about that. Oh, my God. It was a phenomenal um, event where that we had um, 22, as you mentioned. Um, this time we implemented the male models because the first year we didn't have male models. So our goal is, like I said, to bring awareness um and to grow bigger and bigger each year so my show is basically to display we turn our um, devastation into determination and um, to showcase not to um, the blind and visually impaired community but to society just make a different society period that we can do anything this was a, sh a phenomenal show where we had nine designers um, ranging from Ashley Stewart, um, Robert E. Knight, Curvaceous Boutique, um, Big Girls is Fly, um, Define Curves, Lace Couture, and um, Legendary LLC. And um, when we first started the first show, we only started off as five designers. So they just show you the growth bet um, between the first year and the second year, even in the attendance. Um, the first year we had a 175 this year we went over 200 attendees in the show and it was a beautiful beautiful thing to see that these individuals went across the stage knowing that they're visually impaired and blind because we did have assistance as far as um, they use their canes some use the guide dogs some use we also had uh, male escorts as well oh you were fancy female. with it yes i was very <laughs> fancy with it so it was a nice show and everybody um enjoyed it um, we even went virtual and we had over 200 people virtual and it was those that who were attended virtual say oh my gosh i can't wait for the next show they'll yeah. be there in attendance in person so it was a great show very phenomenal and the show what i love about the show is that basically um yes it's, it's a fashion showcase but there's many testimonies uh, um, behind it. Many women have said, I never walked in three inch heels before. You know, it made me feel confident. Um, and these are all uh, ladies or people participating yes. in the show, as you mentioned, yes. who are visually impaired or blind. Blind, yes. 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 So they had to get the heels on. Yes. They had to bring the heels out. They had out. to bring the heels out. And, you know, um, some um, the actually model in lingerie. And, you know, it was a really phenomenal show. It was very successful. And um, as I stated, each as we bring on each show, um, we were able to raise money. This is where the funds that we, the proceeds that we um we contribute is through this show and that's the vehicle that we use it certainly sounds like it is a truly empowering show yes. and then the end result is that you're able to help even more people absolutely so so i love that for those viewing uh for those who are tuned in to morning barbados i would love for you to share what drives your own motivation and determination to keep going even though you've had what a lot of people will deem as a major challenge yeah. what a lot of people can see as a major setback you have you know held on to it with both hands and you're making it work for you mm -hmm. and other people so tell me what drives that motivation in you to keep going sure um it's, it's just like i mentioned before it's just perseverance and the love of helping people because i always ask god to bless me so i can bless bless others and um as long as I have that drive in me and to persevere, sky is beyond the limits, you know? So that's, that's, that's mainly it. It's just the love of helping people. What's your hope for uh, your organization going forward 
and this Not My Eyes fashion showcase that you do every year is coming up again yes. next <laughs> April. Yes. So I know you're going to want to make it bigger yes. and better, and it most certainly will that will be. We're putting that out into the environment. Yes. yes. Um, so, you know, what are your hopes for your organization <clears throat> as you move forward? Well, my hopes, well, so far, the hopes has come through because we actually, all the two years past, I kind of like was planning all of this production by myself. So we have created a team, shout out to my team. And um, we looking forward to actually um, bringing forth on new people as well, because each year they go through different auditions. So they actually have to audition for it and that it will get bigger and better and, um, you know, that we be more recognized. I certainly hope you're having a good time here back home. Do you yes. come home regularly or yes. is this, you know, yes. uh, one it's of regular. those trips? It's yeah. regular. Yeah, we was here last year and the year before. So, <laughs> yes. So you definitely are having a good time at home. Absolutely, I am. Good stuff. Uh, where can we find you online? Okay. Um, um, you can find me on Anna Smith. Um, on Facebook, um, Not My Eyes Fashion Showcase on Facebook, Not My Eyes Foundation on Facebook, and Instagram we is Plus Model Anna Lee on Instagram, um, Not My Eyes Foundation on Instagram, and we do have a TikTok which is um, Not My Eyes Foundation on TikTok as well. I know you also have a website, notmyeyes.com. I think you mentioned that too. Yes. I want to thank you for coming and sharing with us, Anna Lee Bowen smith CEO, founder, and organizer of Not My Eyes, Inc. Yes. It's wonderful to have you with us. Thank you. You have personality to boot with the beautiful <laughs> face. And um, it's wonderful that you're doing so much, not only for you, but for others as well so keep on your journey yes and i wish you every success thank you so much it was a pleasure absolutely hey if you needed a little morning inspiration this is it and then some hey coming up our other segment ironically called the eyes have it that's next stay with us morning 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 Six minutes after seven o'clock today, the eyes have it on Morning Barbados in more ways than one. Now, we didn't have a winner yesterday, so we are back with the same eyes from yesterday for you to identify. Do you recognize these eyes? Can you tell whose eyes these are? Here's your clue again. 
He was a finalist in several competitions over the years, including the Richard Stout Teen Talent Competition, the Junior Monarch Competition, the Party Monarch Competition, Soka Royale, the International Bashment Soka Competition, just to name a few. The eyes have it. Who is he? I'm trying, you see like in the eyes, you can see the little reflection. I was trying to look in the reflection to see if I could see somebody and then determine who the person is looking at so I can identify exactly who it is and that wasn't working out. But I'm sure you'll be better at it than I am. So get close to your telephone lines because you can call us on 228-5562 or 228-5563 to try to identify these eyes. Visualize whose eyes you feel these are, and give us uh, a call if you think you know whose eyes they are. Now, I gave that clue yesterday, so I'm going to jump ahead and give you the second clue, which we didn't do yesterday. He has worked with some of the biggest names in entertainment on several projects, including people like Buster Rhymes. So again, he's worked with big names on several entertainment projects, including Buster Rhymes. Buster Rhymes. Buster Rhymes was just honored as an icon at the BET Award for 2023. And of course, paid big homage to his Caribbean roots. This most certainly is not Buster Rhymes, but we want you to think about who those eyes belong to and see if you can win with us. The eyes have it. We're going to take a break and come on back. Do stay with me. Morning, morning, morning. Good morning. Good morning to you. Good morning to you indeed. Don't forget we have a new game show here on TV8 as well. You have to view throughout the day for a chance to win. You can be an instant winner or you just might have a question to answer. All you have to be do all you have to do rather is watch all day long because you don't know when it will be coming up. And we give you an opportunity to win by answering a simple question. It's called Pizza de Pie. That's right. So if you want your Pizza de Pie, you definitely have to keep watching CBC TV 8. Now, yesterday, you'd know that we featured some exceptional youth, five finalists in the Mr. Executive Business Challenge that's coming up. The actual show is on September 3rd, but they're doing loads until that time to get them prepared and ready for that show, including being a part of a $20 challenge and putting on some projects that will positively impact them and their communities. So after the show, we continued talking to these amazing young men about the work they are doing on their projects. And we wanted to share that with you. So I know a big part of it, as you mentioned, a big part is the leadership community projects that they're undertaking. Uh, so I want to hear from the boys about their individual projects, starting with you, Andre. Tell me about your particular project and how you decided exactly what you wanted to do. Yes, please. So the idea for my project was a bus stop garbage disposal. 
So the idea was actually hard to come by, as in doing the analysis of my community in Cairn Garden. I wanted to think of something that would have that I could do to help benefit the community. But in my community, though, I'm not to say that it's a, a perfect community, but my community is, is fairly clean. Um, we don't really have that much bush in the area. NCC usually takes care of that. And also with the garbage as well, I would have, the idea, the first idea I had was to have garbage, a specified garbage space so that the garbage disposal would be easier. But however, the government has taken care of that with the garbage disposals. So I was saying that even with the hurricane season coming up, that is approaching, I was saying what would be something that I can do to help keep Barbados clean, seeing as we are trying to aim to a more environmental friendly practices and be more sustainable. And also the hurricane season coming up as well, what would be something that can help um, individuals keep the area clean? So the idea, that was how the idea came. So I, I thought about something that would be help keep the environment clean. So that's where the bus stops, the garbage disposals came in, but specifically for the bus stops, because the bus stops in my area, in Cairn Garden, whether you're on the Sugar Hill or Trocomo or it's the Andy Church or Surrey Village site, I find that even when I catch a bus there to go to school, that there's always a lot of garbage in that area. So I thought that having the bus stops, garbage disposals would be a nice initiative. And it would also be in a way that the Mr. Executive logo would also be on these garbage disposals. So having the garbage disposals at the bus stops will help keep the disposal of garbage low and also mitigate all of the garbage that goes into the drains during the hurricane season with all the flooding and the heavy rains. So that would that is how my initiative came about. Oh, that's excellent. Sounds really good. Um, seems like it will be a great initiative that you can carry through uh, to the years ahead. You know, uh, Christian, uh, representing for Graydon Seely School, tell me all about your particular initiative. So my particular project is called Project Terra Farm. It, we in our community have to realize the littering problem that uh, we have in our communities, for example. Let's say Wesley Hall Primary School. Um, the area surrounding Wesley Hall is very, oh, is very um, not up to par for my liking. The, there's litter, there's trash. So, uh, and there's, this is a school for primary children, primary school children. We need to keep that area clean to protect them and their health. So I believe we need to clean up the areas. We plan in Project uh, Terra Farm to clean up communities, address the littering issues. We also plan to um, we also plan to place designated trash areas, trash um, cans, to help mitigate these issues as well. So Project Terra Farm is aims to keep Barbados and the children, the people, and our communities very clean and very um, trash free. Excellent. Sounds like another great project. Dante, representing for Ellerslie School, tell me about your project. Thank you. Now, my project, the name of my project is Helping Hands. And it is set up in two phases. So now, our first phase would be beautification to the bar of St. Steel. And our second phase would be distributing food hampers to persons in the community who are in need and also to the senior citizens home, which is around the corner from the play park. Now, in the play, we're gonna be adding, we're beautifying it, we're making it look a little better because after passing in there for 12 years, you know, from the primary school straight to the secondary school, I saw this part, you know, for 12 years, and it was like, you know, part need a, you know, a renewal, you know, a new layer of paint. And in this part, we're gonna be conducting you know, we're going to be planting, we're going to be painting over benches, adding new layers of paint, um, cleaning up, having a general clean area, making sure it's nice and clean for all the persons in the community, and also following up with that. In the end, we're going to be, you know, distributing some some garbage cans around the play part, you know, having them, you know, a little logo saying, you know, no littering because today we want to continue keeping our communities clean keeping the park clean and i think it's really good because you know there are groups that i am aiming for and that's the youth and the elderly you know those two goals in hand so i think this project is not really i think it's going to be it 
Listen, I'm so happy that you guys are able to do projects that are near and dear to your hearts because you're dealing with your communities. And uh, so you're doing things or working on things that kind of have been, uh, you know, I source to you or you've been struggling with or the changes you'd like to see in your own communities. Micah, it's your turn representing for SLB. Talk to me about your particular project. What are you doing? Yes, please. The name of my project is Growing Healthy. Now, there was an implementation of a policy lately. It was the nutritional policy that was implemented into the schools. And I personally believe that is a, it is a good and a sensible policy that was implemented because not only do you uh, is the government looking after the children and their health, but also there are trying to reduce the death rates and the sickness rates in the community in the country. And so the reason I came up with growing health is because the level from young to old, we want to look at distributing health hampers, it would be infused water because I understand that drinking sweet drinks is not very healthy and it doesn't have much benefits. Um, and so I thought of something that could have been tasty because we like things that taste good and we don't want to live off of things that taste bad. And so I thought of how could I manage to bring out a product that is enjoyable but still healthy? So I thought about infused waters. So me and my group, the project, we will be taking waters and we will infuse different fruits. And the reason we chose to do fruits is because fruits have a lot of vitamin and a lot of nutrients and a lot of benefits and these fruits um would be five various fruits five different fruits i'm looking at doing passion fruit pineapple i'm looking at doing berry or beige and cherry and i'm also looking at doing probably a watermelon because of the benefits and th that these fruits hold and also to complement the drink because are the water because we don't want that someone just drinking water and don't have anything to eat. I love to do a healthy cookie, which would be a banana whole wheat cookie. And these cookies will have chocolate chips in them. Now, when we hear chocolate chips, we may turn towards the unhealthy side, but I'm looking at putting in a dark chocolate chip because the dark chocolate is very rich in iron and it helps with blood and that would be good for the females and the iron and also children growing and these products I will be liking to distribute them to schools. A school, the school name is Eagle Hall Primary in the area of Deacons Road. We will be distributing them on the 11th of July, which would be the Tuesday, and we're looking forward on that day to see the joy of the children. Also, in the package, we'll be putting the instructions and the ingredients because we not only want to look at healthy, but we also want to look at the coming together and the bond between children and their parents now because in this society now there's not much bonding and we want to get back to that place of bonding and unity in Barbados and so we decided to place the instructions within the packaging so and the ingredients and where you could get them from at a low price so the students the parents or relatives whoever they will want to do it with can make these products themselves to have an enjoyable time with their parents with their friends with their relatives so they can both enjoy the flavor of the products 
and also have a enjoyable time. Oh, good stuff. That's a major project. And uh, to hear that you're looking at nutrition in, in that kind of way, something that I can definitely see infused, no pun intended, into everyday community life. To Shane, last word is yours. Share with us about your project. Um, good day again. Um, my project will be a beach cleanup on the East Coast, particularly Bath. So growing up, I've always been, I live in the facility, the vicinity, I've always traveled to Bath with my parents, with my friends, with my family, with my community. We would hold picnics, uh, family get-togethers, community get-togethers down there. But lately, um, sargasm and litter, garbage, has the East Coast, especially. Um, that's where my initiative came from. The love for Bath Beach that I have growing over the years as a child coming out to know. Since I cannot enjoy it as I once was, I really want to lend back a helping hand to the community and also to other people that live close to Bath Beach so they can have that enjoyable fun time back at the beach as they once would. Um, as they once would. Shane, I actually took a walk on Bath Beach last week and the sargassum and, you know, I was actually thinking about a, a cleanup at that beach because there was quite a bit of garbage and uh, I saw uh, quite a few sea urchins and stuff like that on the beach. So I'm more certainly looking forward to what you will do in that area. And I wish all of you the very best of luck. You were very good at presenting your your projects and it's clear to us that there are projects that you're very passionate about and I most certainly hope that even after the competition is over that you you still continue on this trajectory because I love where this competition is taking them Mr. Cumberbatch I know that you've had a number of partners who've worked to yes. help you get them to the place where they are today as well and of course we cannot leave out for example the the, the teachers at the schools who have been working with these boys, the principal, the parents who have been supporting them as well. So many people have come together to make this what it is. And this year really is the inaugural into school. So you can understand that we have stepped up in a big way. And these people are responsible for that major step that we are having this year. Mr. Executive Interschool Business and Gentlemen Challenge. Uh, climaxes. The finals of the pageant is on September 3rd at 6.30 at St. Leonard's Boys School. That's a ways off. I am hoping that in the next few weeks, Mr. Cumberbatch, you have to tell me, we're going to have to move it to the gymnasium. Did <laughs> <laughs> you kind of support that I am sure I'll get from you and CBC and all the other entities involved. I could see that happening at some point in time. <laughs> It's always wonderful to highlight the work of our exceptional youth, especially our boys. Thank you guys for sharing with us this morning, and I wish you all the very best. You're all already winners in our eyes, trust me. It's another Morning Barbados presentation. It's Thursday already. What are you doing as you prepare for the weekend? I certainly hope that you parents are planning for what we call the long holiday, the summer holiday, to make sure that the little ones have loads to do. I know there are lots of camps that are coming back. 
Usually there are national summer camps. There's a camp at the sports council uh, where they can do all manner of disciplines. Uh, I know some schools are putting on camps as well. They're usually camps for athletes. There are camps for academics. So just plan ahead so that the little ones have something to do. And a real high point for me uh, from my childhood used to be vacation Bible school. And that used to be put on by the Seventh-day Adventist Church um, over on Ellerslie School Gap. We really enjoy that, mostly because we got sandwiches. <laughs> Anyways, uh, you know, make sure that you plan for the long holiday for the little ones so that they have something to keep them employed. You know, the devil finds work for idle hands. That's what our older folk used to tell us. And it is absolutely true. So just about 28 minutes now after 7, we promised to tell you all about pan and pork artistry. What a name. Let's welcome Chef Maloney and Dale Harrison to tell us more about this initiative. Good morning, gentlemen. Good morning, Tisha. Good morning, Barbados. All okay, right. Pan Hi. Pork. So what's in the name? Pan and Pork Artistry? Tell me more, Dale Harrison. Okay, Pan and Pork Artistry was from before COVID time, so we decided to bring it back, but we we're bringing it back on the outside of LESC. Um, it is a combination of pan with all the different delights support that you could think of. Michelle will let you know, Chef Michelle will let you know all the different areas that we are stepping into. The pan is about um, local and international. We have the one stroke from Tr in Trinidad. We have RPB. We have Aline's School Orchestra, Steel Orchestra, and many more. All right, so it's over to you, Chef Maloney. Uh, talk to us about this combination, pan and pork. Well, I thought it was always a good idea when it first started, and I have to follow through. So we have a number of vendors being present. Um, also myself, who is the business owner of Smart Catering and Smart Roots. So Smart Catering, we're using most of Smart Roots products. So we're doing some small spare ribs, small pork, pork small pigtails. We are also doing pickle pork, pickle pigtails. We're also doing our two flavors of sausages, which will be maple and our hometown spicy sausage, which will also be small. And for this event only, we will reintroduce our smoked molasses ham. Smoked molasses ham. That's a lot of pork. Pork, many, many, many different ways. Talk to me about the yes, process of talk to me about the process of developing this menu. And I know that Dale told us that it happened a little earlier, and you're kind of bringing it back. So, what are some of the favorites, the ones that people just kept coming back for more? Um, I would have to say it was the the pork, pork, the small sausages, and the small favorites, and the pigtails. Pork in general is anybody's favorite. <laughs> Let's talk about the process of developing the menu. Um, basically, when I develop a menu for any event that features smart catering and smart meats, it's a combination of myself and my husband, who is the butcher and the owner of the smart meats butcher shop. So we normally try to integrate most of our products that we do for supermarkets and banqueting for any function. Things that we know that you normally can't find if you walk off the road into a normal restaurant. We always try to think out of the box. Now, Dale, I know that any event at the LESC is an exceptional one. So I can only imagine what you're pulling together to make the aesthetic outside of the LESC LESC go along with this fantastic menu that we can expect. Okay, we will have a full layout. It's from Friday, July the 14th from 6 p.m. until 11 p.m. On Saturday, we're starting early, um, which is a family day from 12 p.m. until 11 p.m. There's also a kids zone in case you want to bring your whole family and we, the price is only Barbados ten dollars. Children under ten are absolutely free. All right, so ten dollars to get in, and uh, children under ten are absolutely free. It's at a central location. Uh, we know that you know you, you 
is parking going to be actually there as well? Are you doing a parking ride? I know you have the car park area and so on. So talk to us about the parking and the entry parking and exit from the venue actually, and so on. The parking is actually at LESC because we have the, we're using the big car park, but we are utilizing the high rise so that we won't have a challenge with parking or anyone. Security will be tight. There are a lots of bars. There are lots of food. You even get your pickle sauce from other, there are other chefs and other persons. If also, if persons have a port dish that they want to feel that is good enough to come up there and let us know, you can call our port line. <laughs> and let me get that number, which is 243-0607. <laughs> a pork line. <laughs> yes, our pork line two four three zero six and zero seven. I love it, Dale. What is your favorite, or don't you have a favorite? Are you going to be sampling everything? Well, I'm going to be sampling some of everything. Even we have taco <laughs> pork. We have the serpent turf. But who don't want to have? Pork. We also still have like grilled fish and that kind of stuff. You got your cocktails for your ladies, and you have the the bar. You know the men like the bar, so we have that those fully stocked bars. We also have some of Barbados popular DJs who will be at hand to entertain you while the bands are changing. Oh, that sounds wonderful. Uh, Chef Maloney, I know equally as important sometimes as the main, which is the pork at this time, will be some of the sides that will be available. So we want to encourage people to come out. It's on Friday and Saturday. So you know Saturday is really pork day in Barbados, so that's a, that's a given. Friday in the evening for them to come out. Uh, talk to, about, to us about some of the sides that will be available at Pan and Pork Artistry. Um, coming up on the 14th and 15th of July. For sure, I'll be doing our seasoned bright fruit fries and super dead fries. You have your regular fries. Um, some of the other vendors will be doing like scalloped potatoes, macaroni pie, peas and rice, and that sort of stuff. Um, and so be fair. Just about everything we've known to, to come and love about here in Barbados. Let's reinforce about the entertainment that will uh, kind of supplement all of this because that's a big part of it too. Uh, you have a group coming from Trinidad. Uh, you, you mentioned you have RPB. He will be there too? Yes, he will be there. And all we right. have the bronze group from, from Trinidad. Also, we have two local school steel band orchestra along with two other exciting steel pans from combined from Barbados. Oh, we also have a lot of um, DJs, which would be like Level Vibes. And I won't tell you all, but come and see on July the 14th and 15th at LESD. Can we pre-purchase tickets or must we buy tickets on the day of? You can pre-purchase your tickets at LESC and we are taking cash at the door. All right, so you can go get your tickets. I personally like to pre-purchase tickets so uh, that, that you make sure that, you know, you don't have to go join a, a long queue trying to get in uh, on the day of the event. So from 6 o'clock, it's running to what time in the evening on Friday? On Friday from 6 p.m. to 11 p.m. and on Saturday, from 12 noon until 11 p.m. Tickets are already going fast, so I would ask you if you want to get tickets, to come to LESC, you could call 467-8200 and our reception will help you, or you could call our port line 243-0607. And I love that you also said, Dale, that if there's anybody out there who's doing a pork dish or they have a famous pork dish, they still could have the opportunity to come and set up and be a part of the pad and pork presentation. Yes, we're trying to encourage locals and those local people that are not establishing their self and know that they have a, a, a creativity in them with pork and food, whatever you have. Just come and see if we could work with you and we would guide you along the way. 
All right. I certainly hope, uh, Chef Maloney, that you're going to have some kind of sampler where people who would like a, a taste of all the dishes have the opportunity to do that as well. Because we know sometimes with these things, the challenge is a too much choice dilemma. It is always, and we always leave for the bar sample box. So you can have a combination and you can build your box on the spot. Build your box on the spot. You forgot a word. Build your pork box. <laughs> on the spot. <laughs> Build your pork box on the spot. I, I love it. So the children under 10 are absolutely free. And then obviously from uh, 10 onwards, just $10 per person to come on in. And I love these events, Dale, because they're an opportunity for the entire family to come out together and spend a little time, especially at a time like this. Uh, you don't necessarily want to, well, you can't take the little ones to a vet, and there are not a lot of crop over events for them. But because you have the pan included, they could feel like a part of the festival too. Uh, enjoying the music of the festival and then of course spending some time with the parents I'm sure that's a major part of why you're putting on this event at the LESC yes it is because we have our children's zone then we will have some comfortable seating for persons that are not able to stand on their feet the entire event you could sit down relax enjoy even if you want to bring your chair you could bring your chairs and enjoy the atmosphere all right, and you don't have to tell some people twice there will be a bar, namely me. <laughs> All right, so Chef, Chef Maloney, uh, you know, final word of encouragement for people about those dishes that you're going to be making available. And just a reminder of everything that will be available on Friday and Saturday, July 14th and 15th at the Lloyd Erskine Sandiford Center for this presentation of pan and pork artistry. Tell us. Um, for sure, you're going to have the small pork, the Chinese box pork, ham, baked pork, pork rolls, pork stew, jerk pork, two flavors of sausages, small, small molasses, ham also, small spare ribs, small pulled pork, small chicken wings also for those who don't eat pork. Everything small, plus a lot of other vendors with a wide variety. We also have our size, the breadfruit chips, the sweet potato fries, the regular fries, the loaded fries. So you need to come out, support, and enjoy the pork fest. All right, good stuff. And of course, I heard some things that Barbadians might not be familiar with, uh, you know, like spices like jira and garam masala yes. and things like that really bring out the natural flavors, but you find them more in East Indian cooking. Uh, so, you know, people of Guyanese and Trinidadian descent use those spices a lot more in their dishes. So definitely looking forward to the flavors that you will be bringing out on the day. I want to thank you both for coming on and sharing with us. And uh, we definitely look forward to some pan and pork artistry at the Lloyd Erskine Sandiford Center on July 14th and 15th. Parking is easy. They're using the car park. Uh, on the property, uh, they're going to use the car park for the celebration. You can come out with your own chairs. Um, there's, as they say, bar will be solid <laughs> and so much more. So you definitely should have a good time. Thank you so much, ladies. We definitely look forward to this event coming up on two fantastic days. And uh, I think it will be an amazing success because as we know, Bajans love pork. It's the Pan and Pork Artistry event coming up. Make sure you get your tickets. You can pre-order or you can get your tickets at the door. And on Friday the 14th, it's going to run from 5 to 11. And then on Saturday, it's going to run all day. So make sure you check it out. Thank you so much, Dale Harrison of the LESC and Chef Maloney of Smart Catering. Thank you. You're most welcome. All right, good stuff. How about that? Get yourselves together and make sure you plan for that. I hope to see you there. I most certainly will pass by. Maybe a, a, you know, a group from CBC we can get together and short down the road and have a good afternoon. Reminiscent of what we used to do back in the day here in the CBC car park for 
crop over. We're going to take another break, and when we come back, more of the eyes have it. Do you think you know who the featured person is today? We're also going to feature some exceptional youth from the St. Gabriel School. Stay with us. Morning, morning, morning. Good morning. Good morning to you. The eyes have it. You know those eyes have no lashes. I dare say we're going to have to add some lashes. All right, we're going to give you a chance to call a little bit later. So get close to those phone lines, 228-5562 and 228-5563. So we gave you two clues. Uh, the first clue was he was a finalist in several competitions over the years. Richard Stout Teen Talent Competition, the Junior Monarch Competition, the Party Monarch, Soka Royale, International Bashment Soka Competition, and that's just to name a few. He has also worked with some of the biggest names in entertainment on several projects, including Bassa Bass, Busta Rhymes. Who can it be? Can you tell me whose eyes these are? The eyes definitely have it. So, you know, think about it. Do a little bit of consulting with whomever you need to so that you can get it right once we take those calls. All right. Can you tell me whose eyes these are? The eyes have it today on Morning Barbados. So every day we try to feature young people from here in Barbados, across the region and across the world who are doing wonderful things to make a big difference to our world as we know it. We love to call them our exceptional youth. Now, recently we've been hearing a lot about these STEM programs that are going all across Barbados, science, technology, uh, environmental studies, mathematics, all together. 
and we have a few young people who are working on amazing projects that we want to share with you this morning. Now, Mara Hinkson is the parent representative at the St. Gabriel School, and sharing with us are Amaris Lynch, Jaden Hinkson, Miles Walcott, Kofi Steele, Emery Graham, and Sienna Lewis, all students of the St. Gabriel School. And they're going to share with us about their projects under the theme STEM Ovation. Good morning and welcome. Good morning. Good morning. All right. Let me start with uh, the parent representative. Good morning. Tell us all about this particular project. Well, I can say I've had extensive discussions with the teacher of J1G, Mrs. Guthrie, about this project. And it came across immediately her love for teaching them, her love for children, her dedication to being the same. So she had fueled their curiosity. She had inspired them to explore the fascinating world of science, technology, engineering, mathematics, and innovation. I know for engaging lessons, hands on activities, and real world applications to instill in these children a deep love for STEM subjects. I know that she has expressed to me that she hopes her enthusiasm becomes infectious and it has and can speak from my one. And she strives to make learning a thrilling adventure for them. So it has been an exciting project for them. And I look forward to hearing all of these projects that they have created. That we're starting them from this, yeah, which means kindness, and it's something that has been really important to her. So, tell her how it came about why you chose kindness. I That's chose important. kindness because it's um, really important, and people can get hurt all around you, and nobody likes getting hurt, and it's not very, it doesn't make you feel any better. And it just makes the world not a very nice place to live in. So I chose to be kind so that children could see what it was like and it would show them different ways to be kind, how you can be kind and kind of your way. That is beautiful. And it's a, a great reason for you to choose kindness absolutely love it now Kofi tell me a little bit about your project my project is called go car it's a device that will keep your car cool all day how did you come up with the idea to do this particular project then I go into my car, my car is really hot, so I still have an advice that I keep my car cool all day, so when I go back into the car, my car is not hot, so I don't have to wait for it to cool down. Well, you know, that is how uh, projects become major things that people use because you know once you find that there's a need and you're able to make a product or offer a service that helps people make things better that they use every day then they're very interested and i know for me every day i go outside my car is very hot too so that's definitely something i would want to hear more about sienna tell me more about your project for my project I donated clothes, shoes, and toys to the Salvation Army because they help persons that are in need. Oh, that is excellent. It's really... Oh, sorry, continue. I created an app called Support Wave that you can... You can... Receive or give to people that are in need. We will also deliver those items to people's, to persons' homes while keeping their identity 
anonymous. <laughs> oh, so beautiful. We also have Emery on the line. So Emery Graham, another student. Hi, Emery. Welcome to Morning Barbados. Hi. All right. Tell me all about your project. My project is about helping people with that that don't have much water or 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 fans, and without that, people could die. So I made a I made a product called a Keep Cool Hat. It has some it has something like a fan and and because it will keep people cool and it has a container with a straw so people can drink clean fresh water oh that's excellent when there's a heat wave. oh that that's great and it, it it truly is hot we heard that a day this week was actually the hottest day recorded in a long time in the entire world so your project is very relevant as well. Mrs. Morrill Hinkson, uh, I'm going to give you the first word, the last word, sorry, to uh, wrap up about the project for us. Uh, what's the age range of these little ones who have joined us this morning? Some very There's interesting some projects and it's great, uh, it's great that they're getting involved, as I mentioned before, from this very early age. Yes, yeah, so I will leave the last word to my son, Jaden Hinkson, who is also a part of the project. They're between seven to eight, and he wanted to just have a quick word as to what he contributed in, and his idea. Okay, wonderful. Go ahead, Jay. Good morning, Ms. Hines, and good morning, Barbados. In my view, the cost of travel to other countries is too expensive. I think it is so expensive because of the rising cost of travel. This will eliminate the need for fuel entirely and make travel accessible for each many accessible to many more people. Excellent. Definitely some practical things that we can all use. And again, I defer to you, Mrs. Murrell Hinkson, to, uh, you know, just wrap everything up in a beautiful bowl for us as we move forward. Uh, great to feature the young people and the wonderful project that they're doing. Yes, and I want to thank you, Ms. Hines, for giving us the platform to expose these children to the ideas. The STEM is really based on the ideas that they have to help in the world. And if comparing these wonderful kids' ideas, it means to me, or it signals to me, that Barbados is in good hands. So I want to thank you again for allowing us the opportunity for these who want to share their ideas with you and the wider Barbados, and have a good day. And to you as well, I know you're heading off to school, so have a wonderful day at school today. And thanks for coming and sharing with us. Uh, we enjoyed having you here very much, and good luck on your projects. Thank you. Uh, always wonderful to hear from the little ones. And Whitney Houston fooled us. She said the children are the future. The children are our now. So make sure that we give them the platform they need to be able to share and grow and be a part of the now. All right, we're going to take a break. When we come back, I'm taking your calls to see if you know whose eyes we're featuring today. Stay with us.
let's take a quick call, see if this caller knows who it is. Welcome, the eyes have it. Welcome to Morning Barbados. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. How are you? Where are you calling us from? I'm calling from New York. <laughs> Welcome to a piece of home. Do you know whose eyes these are? Is it Morrisville? Is it who? Marsville. Marsville. Is it Marsville? Uh, the next clue I was going to give is he's also a proud father of five beautiful children. So the, the question is, posed to the gallery, is it Marsville? <laughs> the answer is yes. Yay. Congratulations. Thank you. <laughs> oh, did you know it was his eyes from the very beginning? Mm, kind of. I, I had an idea. All right. Well, thank you for tuning in and congratulations for playing and winning. Where in New York are you, Brooklyn? I'm in Brooklyn. All right. So uh, sending love from Barbados and thanks for tuning in. Are you a part of my Morning Barbados group on uh, the WhatsApp? Oh, I think we've lost her. All right, well, that's it from us for today. The time goes by too quickly. Uh, we're going to have another great show for you tomorrow. Remember, it's the Morning Barbados breakfast party, so make sure you tune in for that as well. Remember to wear your smiles as you go about your day today and come on back to us tomorrow. Have a wonderful day. We also have Q in the community coming up today at the Police Sports Club. So head on out and be a part of it. You can also tune in to 100.7 FM from 11 o'clock this morning to be a part of Q in the community. Remember, Q is good for you. Have a good one from the entire crew. Bye-bye. Wake up, wake up, wake up, wake up. Barbados, get up. Good morning.